I have the very strange and uncomfortable task of presenting myself. Um, so for those that don't know me, my name is Frank Perkins. I'm CEO of Adari. Um, my company is, a, is an insure tech. Um, we provide policy administration systems for insurance and reinsurance companies, and we use blockchain. Um, I will not be talking about Inari today in the presentation. We're talking about a different topic. Um, my background is in technology uh, for over 20 years now. So when you say that out loud in public, I feel very old. So I am very old. Um, my background within technology has always been in financial services, uh, telecommunications, and defense, and until recently, uh, insurance. Very fortunate to be, be talking here today. So the, the presentation today is a uh, blockchain in the media industry, right? And so we're going to sort of divide it up into, into three bits. We'll talk a bit about what is blockchain, because sometimes you, know, you hear many conflicting stories. We're going to work through that, what it does and, and what it doesn't do. Um, why, then we'll talk a little bit about why is this important, not only for media, but for talent as well. So what, what, what does the technology intersect with, with real life needs? And then, because usually or many times with blockchain, people talk about what it can do, but not what it does do, then we'll have a couple of examples of what it is doing in the media industry, right? So, so the easiest way to explain, there's a bit of a way, I've got a very good friend, um, he is very non-technical, and the way he describes blockchain, it's like a big Excel file in the sky that nobody owns and everybody shares, right? Which I think is, at least for the underlying protocol, is very, very true, right? So. The idea behind, behind uh, the protocol of blockchain and, and all the things that we've built on top of it is basically it's, it's sharing data. Right? It's, it's sharing data in such a way that no one specifically owns that information. Everybody owns the data. It's a way that we can share data um, with the certainty that that data hasn't been tampered, which is the immutability piece. And then traceability and a lot of transparency. Right? So you know, one of the fundamental ideas of the technology, and it should be, and, and that's one of the big things, is how do we de democratize information between different parties and, and, and different places? And on top of that, we'll see in a moment, we, you can build all these different things, right? But it's, um, it's a bit of a misnomer what I put here, because blockchain, you know, th this thing that would describe the Excel file in the sky, which nobody owns and everybody shares, isn't actually blockchain. It's a layer above it, which is what we would call distributed ledger, right? So blockchain is a protocol. And to put it into to, to context, this is similar, you know, in the 1960s and 70s when we started to develop the very first uh, technology protocols like uh, you know, TCP IP. No one would imagine back then you know, on this TCP IP protocol one day would be streaming or sharing pictures of cats or meeting long lost relatives, right? So, so an important thing to note is when someone is very, very certain knowing what the future of blockchain is, that's probably not true, right? We, it evolves over time and ideas that were really good then in practice are not so good and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So, so it's an uh, exciting moment. So what things can we can we build on, on this technology? Well, we, here we have sort of the, the more common things, right? But again, this is, these are the things that exist today. Uh, as I said, you were saying before, there's a completely different application outside of this that's also been built on it. So we have uh, things that everybody are familiar with, coins or, or cryptocurrencies. Um, so some of you may have become very wealthy at some point or very poor at some point uh, with cryptos. Um, it's you know, unfortunately, especially with things like FTX and, and stuff like that, it's uh, not in the best light, but this is something that, you know, it's a, it's a very good application that will find its home someplace in the future, probably. Uh, the other thing is tokenization, um, and so I think we've been seeing concepts around that as well. Like, how, how do I have an asset, and how do I prove that I have that asset, asset digitally? And that could be an asset that exists in the real world, that we're connecting to by a token, or in the other real world, which is the digital world, which is just as equally as real, right? Um, we have the concept of distributed applications. Um, um, so that's the, you know, you have an app on your phone or you have an app on your computer, that application resides only on that device, right? Or when you're using I don't know, a CRM tool, that application only resides on that device. The idea behind a distributed application is through a blockchain network, that application exists everywhere, right? And, it's, um, and we'll see a little bit more about that later on. And then I think that all these applications, you know, after, after coins and tokens, the, the, you know, the, the, the two closer one, the two other closer ones are, are the ledger. So that, that's actually where we write information for blockchain and it moves around. So the coin uses the ledger. This is, this is the Excel file on the sky piece. And then automation. Sometimes you may have heard of it about smart contracts. 
smart, dumb JavaScript, you know, the smarter JavaScript can be. But that's the, that's one of the, the, the points when you have this big distributed system, how do you make things happen without interaction with people and, and in a very objective manner, and that, and that is uh, the automation piece, right? So some of the, the key things around around blockchain, which is, you know, sometimes they get, we forget about these things, or, or people developing applications forget about these things, but it is a transformational technology when used properly. And some of the, the key points is, is trust, right? So the point that you have a system where everybody can access it, see it, validate what's on there, you start to have a component of trust between parties that don't know each other. So it's a, you know, a decentralized trust, if you will. The next bit is, decent, is exactly that, decentralization. Right? So, um, and we'll see why that's very important uh, later on, but you know, in, in modern systems and the applications that you use, many different things, you're going to one specific place under the control of one specific party. And what blockchain brings to, for, to the table is being able to this, decentralize an application, an asset, coin, piece of data and have that everywhere. Along with this sort of democratization of that information that you have the trace of traceability and transparency, they, they sort of go hand in hand, right? So um, so let's say you do, you know, several, you know, there's a big project now for to replace SEPA transfers instead of banks talking to each other one to one or by APIs, actually use a blockchain to do that. If that will ever come to fruition with a different conversation, banks are banks. Um, but the idea behind that is I can actually look at transfer and, and be very clear on where that transfer has gone, how that transfer was made, and uh, theoretically access that piece of information. Security, um, you know, it's, um, it's not 100% secure, but it's pretty secure um, in the sense of when I write something to a blockchain, uh, there's a great deal of certainty that um, that information will not get tampered with in time. Right? You know, there's a Security is never 100%, but it's got a pretty high amount of security. Automation is the other the other piece. And funnily enough, uh, you have speed, right? So um, one of the big problems some, some of the earlier versions of blockchain had, and that's normal because these are engineering problems, it's, it's things that get solved over time, is they weren't very fast, right? So if you remember back in the crypto boom of 2017 and 2018, when like, even my mother was going online and buying bitcoins and Ethereum and stuff, these transactions would have taken a long amount of time to, 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 to update, right? There's been a lot of progress in this, right? So, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of activity in this space as, you know, the first versions of something, you know, they'll be okay, but then over time, these are engineering problems, and engineering problems usually get solved. So, the different types of these underlying blockchains, now there's a, there's a couple of different types, and that depends on, on, on the use case, right? So. Your most typical type is a public uh, permissionless blockchain, right? So um, these would be the, the, the things that you usually see in the news, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other like that. So these are these are networks that many people share. There's all different nodes, and, and anybody can access it, etc. And then the central authority um, controls that. On the other side, which is permission, we have private and consortium blockchain. So private blockchain, um, my product is. We have blockchain network, that's what the application uses to store data. It's a private network, and what we're getting out of blockchain is more around immutability and, and, and other such items. Um, this could be the bank itself. Um, HSBC has their own internal blockchain that connects all their offices worldwide. So they have the advantages, which are many, of the blockchain but keeping it in control. Right? And then we have consortium, so that's a, so this is when several companies will come together and define a standard because they want to accomplish using that technology a, a task. Um, you know, within financial services, there's one famous one, which is Corda. So that was Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley and, and others. And they all came together and said, okay, we want to be able to transit information using this technology. We sort of trust each other, but not that much. So that's why we're looking blockchain. And then they bring their own standard. And sometimes that standard will permeate out to the, the general public. And you can use that. And then you have this this type of network in the middle, which is, which is hybrid. Um, which is you know, permissionless but controlled by, by an authority. You know, it doesn't mean that privates are bad and publics are good. They all serve a, a very different purpose. So where are we today in, in, in the world of blockchain? This is, a, this is a very famous graph that's applicable pretty much to any technology. And so everybody gets very, very excited because we've discovered something new. Um, this new shiny thing solves everything, which is where we were a couple of years ago. Then when these things start, start to get rolled out, they don't really do anything, they don't, they're not living up to the, to the name. 
uh, lots of people disappear and they, can, they turn themselves into evangelists of other technologies and, and then people that we really like and, and, and use this technology, then we have that sort of way upwards when we can actually got rid of the noise, got rid of all the evangelization of a particular thing and we can actually work with that technology to make it, make it useful. So, just to give a, an expectation of time, so around about 2011, 2012 were around the innovation trigger. So that was the first white papers around uh, Bitcoin and stuff like that. That's when that guy paid I don't know, like 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza, um, which is now the most expensive pizza in history, <coughs> even if the car broke goes. Then over here, this is when absolutely everybody was doing a blockchain project and doing an ICO and, and stuff. And, you know, everybody was super rich, you know, a couple of kids would set up a, a network and then raise you know, $40 million. And, 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 uh, and literally I've seen block, block, blockchain projects saying blockchain will cure cancer. I mean, the, 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 the level of this, you know, uh, bit got, got to. What happened then, you know, after two years of development, a lot of these technologies did nothing and then we were here. <coughs> and now we're sort of on the slope of the enlightenment. So, so we're starting to see very fun, very tangible, very useful applications of the technology. Sometimes very, very different to what we were promised in the beginning, and that's the evolution of, of any sort of tool. Okay, so you've got the protocol, you've got the technology, we sort of know what it does, we can build applications on it, we can use it to, to validate assets, it can make it distributed, it can be public, it can be private, it can be hybrid, it's trustworthy, it's decentralized. So the next point we come to is, well, why is this even, you know, why would media care? Is it even a useful technology for the media industry in, in this case, or, or any other industry for that fact? And then how does that impact things like talent? Right? So looking at the, the media space, and there's a couple of examples later on. Imagine that I'm a content creator of whatever content it is. I could be producing a piece of art, a comic book, a movie, whatever. So my first incentive to use my talent in that space is I like doing these things. I like drawing, I like painting, I like music, right? And then when you start to take a look at the way the market works, I have intermediaries, everybody's taking a piece, I can't track it, um, people are cloning my work, people downloading it illegally, all these different things to say, okay, well, you know, I, have, I have a vocation with my talent to get into the media industry, into art, into communication, but then where's the benefit? I need to live off something, right? So, and so I think um, the point we are today, is it's, it's in a very, very strange and very, very uh, interesting time where everybody can create content. But we're, so it's a, a very new concept, right? So it's, a, it's a new idea that I can sit down on my phone and you know, create something that is valuable for everybody else. But on the other hand, the tools that we have to, to, to articulate this are legacy tools, right? So you have big media companies, you have big, very controlled networks, uh, you know, the, the ad model, the, the revenue, how can I ascertain that I have DRM or IP, or all these sort of things. So you have new challenges, old technology, and they're, they're colliding. So this is where uh, applications of, of blockchain can come in to actually help with this. So some examples that we have, it's, um, you know, um, how can, how can blockchain help me monetize my copyright material, for instance, right? So that's, uh, that's where traceability comes in. I create a, create a piece, of, piece of art. Yeah. Oh. Sort out royalties and rights and all these sort of things. 
over time what you're uh, enabling to do is actually remove the boundaries of, of content consumption. Right? And so this is why these sort of technologies can help with it. Um, next point is automating things like royalty payments. Right? So uh, uh, if you create a piece of content now and you're doing something you need to uh, dispute the royalty, that's a very, very long process. It doesn't really need to be. It's very clear that I'm producing a piece of work, someone's consuming it, or maybe someone else is publishing it on my behalf. How do I make these mechanisms uh, work for me and, and, and uh, uh, execute these sort of uh, transactions? And then one which is, uh, <laughs> we haven't spoken before, but tied in, which is connecting sort of real world media assets into, into, into the meta metaverse. So how do I take something that I own, and, when I, you know, and you can discuss it, what real world is. Right? There's different interpretations, but how do I take that and how can I bring that on my journey into whatever a metaverse or multiple metaverse as well? What's the mechanic to do that? And then how can I ascertain that that's real, that's mine, that asset is mine? You know, as you get more into digital spaces, it's very hard to define what's mine. Right? And these sort of technologies have help you do that. So, so we spoke before that, you know, the Especially within within blockchain, these things a lot of people they can they can they can they can they can. But what's the actual um, real application? Right? So as a disclaimer, I, I, I have no interest in any of these organisations. This is just the, the piece of research I, I did. Um, usually, I'm not in the media and art space. I've been in other spaces here, so this was a, an interesting um, uh, investigation to do here. So here we have three three um, examples. Right? So the first one is. is uh, Luvio and Eluvio, and so what they do is, is actually that uh, sort of content without boundaries. And I think now they're working with quite a lot of big companies. So what they've done is they've created a, a system whereby uh, you as a content creator can submit that content into this uh, decentralized network, this permissionless network, and you have a, a very, very, very fine-tuned control of where that content is being consumed. Right? So maybe I put a piece of content out and that goes through a, you know, a third party, I can track that. Someone may download it, pay for it, I can track that. So that's starting to give the content creators a lot of visibility into what they're doing. Because right now, you know, even if you publish something on YouTube, you publish something on YouTube, you don't really have visibility. You may see the monetization. It may be a black hole of something that's demonetized or not. You, you have some reporting, but you can't really drill down to that. At the end of the day, you, you've created that piece of content. And I think they're working with people like Fox and others to, 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 to really push that out. Not only, is that, um, not, is, not only does it enable them to contact their audiences in a very, very direct manner and then alter their content over time, it's also that borderless consumption, right? So why restrict yourself to one market when you can have all of them at the same time? Another interesting example is Mycenas. And so Mycenas is very interesting in the sense that I have a piece of physical real world art, a uh, painting. And then I can go in, and what they've done is they've tokenized that. I can go in and buy a piece of that art. And over time, that art may go up in value, and then I can actually sell a little piece of it. So imagine, for instance, that you know, the Mona Lisa doesn't exist, and it exists on painted tomorrow, right? I can go in and buy a piece of that. In 200 years from now, because now we have light extension technology, I can go ahead and sell my piece of the Mona Lisa. So it's very, 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 very interesting thing. Also, you know, uh, as an artist, knowing that you have some sort of way to monetize in a more immediate but manner the work that you do enables artists to work as artists and not having to work inside the bigger so this is a very interesting piece of technology and it also shows you the traceability of ownership and then uh, and this is a, a really really interesting one at lucidity so the lucidity i think they partnered with toyota and what they've done is they've created a, a network for, for ad production and revenue it's extraordinarily chaseable, so you can see where all these different components are going, you know, this click bots and all these different um, um, problems that the, the ad industry faces. And so um, when doing this, this program with Toyota, they, they increased it, there's a 21% rise in ad performance. So I asked some friends that work in the industry if this was a big number or a small number, because they don't work in the ad industry, and they said this was very substantial in terms of digital ads getting a 21% yield or, or rise in how those ads were working was, is, a, is a very, very big deal. And the applications, they're, they're, they're more so, you know, um, um, like we've been talking about today, traditionally, blockchain has been just that distributed ledger that you can only store small pieces of data as the technology improves, we can start storing more and more data on it. Right? So as we get more efficient on running blockchains, 
and more efficient in the storage and power consumption, which is an engineering feat in itself. We can start uh, putting much more sizable data on it. So that's what we're seeing before the NFTs. You, what you have in the NFT is effectively a piece of hexadecimal code somewhere in the ether. But the actual asset is on, on an Amazon server, it's in your own server, right? So what we're working towards now is actually being able to put that on there. Um, so you can actually store a video and not, you know, and not run up immense bills. Um, the other piece as well, which, um, and this is something that the movie was looking at, is actually 4K streaming via blockchain. Right? So I can actually stream content in real time and then see where that content is going. So, um, for instance, where, where this has applications, imagine things like, something I, I like football. Right? So football, you have pay-per-view football. Right now it's very hard for, for whoever owns that right to actually trace where it goes. You can go on Roja Directa, sort of see it for free, or, or other sort of places. Right? Well, when you start using that streaming service right on the blockchain, you can see where the exit points and the entry points are of all that. Um, because you're able to measure it in real time, you can actually do things connecting with ads to, to do contextual ads, depending on how the match is going and that sort of stuff. And these are these are real life applications. Right? But the important thing around this is, is, is not only real life applications for an industry, it goes back to um, what we mentioned in the middle of the presentation, it's around talent. Right? So uh, the more mechanisms I have be able to, to uh, publish my content and receive monetization for it, the more incentive I have to actually pursue these things. So, you know, I bet there's many people that have um, felt the vocation for something in the artistic world or any world for that fact, and because it wasn't something that was easy to monetize, you say, oh, well, I'm going to work in an office, for instance. Well, these are the, the, this is the real world impact of technologies like this when implemented properly, uh, allows you to attract much more, much more talent. And where we're seeing a lot of this in this space is not only in the engineering thing, actually when you start building these layers of it, all these people are attracting in to, to, to use these sort of uh, frameworks and technologies. So, that was, that was the presentation. So I'm going a bit quick because I know we, we, we're in a constraint of time. So, if, happy to take any questions or if there's any questions you want to ask afterwards. That's okay. It's just a really quick one. that to build 